Right. Okay. So let's get started. Oh, just just to check. Just one one last time. Oh, basically everybody's here. Cool. Okay. Recap. Last time uh, on Tuesday we talked about recurrent neural networks and G how to the variants of them, the GRU, the gated recurrent unit, and long short term memory. Um, so it was most, most mostly just mathematical demonstration and the basic concepts. And today we're going to try to uh, implement them uh, using PyTorch. By the way, any any question from the last time, RNNs or backprop, uh, gradient descent, maximum likelihood, GRU, any anything that I missed or that uh, maybe one of you guys want me to go over again. No. Okay, cool. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about Py, uh, implementing RNN with PyTorch. And uh, this may be like too easy for some of you who might who might be already very familiar with PyTorch, but some of you may not be. Uh, according, to, according to the poll in, in the very first time, in the very first class, some of you were like not really familiar with either TensorFlow or, or PyTorch. So in order to be able to do assignment number three the last one and also the project you need to be able to implement stuff with pytorch could be i mean yeah um it's okay to do with tensorflow but if you're starting new and fresh you might want to start with pytorch instead of tensorflow okay so there are some prerequisites you know you can develop pytorch uh, deep learning models just on on the terminal with like Vim or or text editor or like uh, like Atom text editor or wh whatever like whatever is your choice. But it is definitely much easier to use Python notebooks. Uh, so we're gonna try to start on you. I'm just gonna go over to if anybody is not familiar with Jupyter notebooks or Jupyter Lab. I'm gonna uh, tell you guys the uh, the easiest way to install Jupyter. So that will be the prerequisites, and then we're gonna talk about PyTorch Autograd, how like the basic concepts, and uh, something called Python module, and then we're gonna do some naive RNN implementation without mini batch, and then gonna do the original RNN with mini batch. All right. Right. So. The reason that I'm choosing PyTorch over TensorFlow is that so TensorFlow 1.0 versus PyTorch. So TensorFlow 1.0 uses so as I said, uh, typically neural networks are represented as DAGs or directed acyclic graphs in these these types of like autograd libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Tiano. They all use the concept of DAG to represent neural networks. But in order to train them on GPU or CPU, TensorFlow and PyTorch takes a different route, different approach. So TensorFlow compiles the DAG first and then runs it. And uh, PyTorch compiles as you go, or more, most like, it's more, well, more likely it's called like a eager mode. So you, you first define the DAG and then you, you compile them as you go. And then TensorFlow has a bigger boilerplate code to write compared to PyTorch. It means like there's something called like session and like you have to define certain stuff before you actually start beginning to implement your neural network. So it's just more tedious. Uh, so the pros of TensorFlow, the pro of ten, pros of TensorFlow is that it's supposed to be faster than PyTorch because as I said, PyTorch uh, uses eager mode on default. So it compiles as you go compared to this. So I mean, intuitively, pre-compiling your DAG and then just running it is should be faster than like doing a lazy comp compilation. So it's supposed to be fast, but some people say PyTorch is as fast as TensorFlow, so I'm not really sure. But TensorFlow is at least that's what the general understanding is that it's supposed to be faster than PyTorch, and because of that, it's good for production. Uh, so it was built from the beginning to with the consideration of production. So you, once you train your model, you it is easier to distribute your model on multiple devices or 
like or large or on large devices, small devices, like on a on a mobile phone or like like gigantic servers. Doesn't uh, TensorFlow is just more adaptable compared to PyTorch. All right, so that's TensorFlow 1.0. There's TensorFlow 2.0, but we'll talk about that later. So, so that's TensorFlow original TensorFlow versus PyTorch. And so I'm not. Maybe some of the uh, students have already seen this graph, but so TensorFlow came before PyTorch. So TensorFlow came out in I don't know, like 2015, 2015-ish, I guess. Uh, PyTorch a bit later. There was something called Torch, which was written in Lua. So it wasn't it wasn't very popular. But then I think Facebook started a pro open source project too. Uh, implement Torch in Python. So that is why it's called PyTorch. And PyTorch is catching up. TensorFlow came out before PyTorch, so it was definitely the most popular like uh, deep learning library. But now PyTorch is catching up. So what this is, it's a number of unique mentions. So when people write papers in like top tier journals, like ECC, like vision journals or uh, language, NLP journals, ICML, CVPR, NIPS, I iClear, ICV, MNLP. So these are like top machine learning journals. I mean, conferences, machine learning conferences. And people write in the paper like what they use to do experiments in their paper. And the unique mention is some people, some, some papers say, that they both use TensorFlow and PyTorch, but mostly people don't do that. So mostly researchers just stick to either TensorFlow or PyTorch. And so that's the unique mention. Like a paper mentions only PyTorch or a paper mentions only uh, TensorFlow. And you can see the graph is just skyrocketing for, for PyTorch. And it's just mostly TensorFlow TensorFlow users have saturated. The number of TensorFlow users have saturated. So the, the dots are TensorFlow line and the solid lines are the PyTorch lines. And especially here in CVPR. No, is it NIPS or CVPR? It's, uh, yeah, it's hard, to, hard to see. Right, okay, so CVPR. Okay, so CVPR, which is like the largest vision conference venue in, in machine learning. So, yeah, so you can see it is just, it's not going to stop here. And it's not just in the conferences, just generally in, so archive, if anybody's not familiar with archive, so archive is where you just submit your paper without any peer review. So you can submit, well, you can, not, not just paper, you can submit your report, your technical reports, or just simple math derivations, whatever, but so archive is where people can freely share their work. And uh, so it's way, way larger than, like there should be like millions, I, not, maybe not millions, but like at least like hundreds of thousands of papers uploaded here already. And so there's again, uh, is it unique mention? Maybe not. Uh, maybe it's just the, number, the ratio between the two. Okay, maybe it's like maybe it's a mention or maybe it's the ratio. But anyway, you can see that the red line. So starting from 2017 January, red line was there, but now it's catching up, like like this. So this is already last year, 2019 March, May, June. Uh, pretty sure it's probably like already just above the yellow line now. And you can see the the this is okay. So this is the uh, the rate of growth or the the percentage the growth percentage so from january to june in a given year which is 2018 2019 so 2018 uh not so much so 2018 pytorch was not so not 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 that big but in 2019 now it's growth rate like growth ratio is one, one almost 200 percent compared to 23 percent of tensorflow so like tensorflow has already reached its maximum potential but pytorch is like still growing and uh, all right, so the so you can see that why Google is having trouble trying to make TensorFlow popular again, and that's why they came up with TensorFlow 2.0. And uh, it's so uh, the essence of TensorFlow 2.0 is that it's trying to be similar to PyTorch. So, as I said, ten, ten, PyTorch is 
uses eager mode and TensorFlow precompiles the DAG. And that's be, because of that, TensorFlow is just more difficult to debug. And it's just not not very easy to handle. It's just just you know like not not very wheel wieldy. So that's why Google came up with TensorFlow 2.0, which is basically trying to be trying to mimic my PyTorch, which is yeah, which is which which is, which just says that the Google was taking a like a not not the best approach in the beginning. And so it's you it's basically just eager mode for TensorFlow TensorFlow 2.0. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see what the future of TensorFlow 2.0 will be. And there is something another library called Jax, which is like the newest kid on the block, and it's also developed by Google. And not a lot of people know this, but Jax is a way more, it's even more like easier to handle than PyTorch in some aspects. So it's a, so Jax supports higher order differentiation. So all all like TensorFlow uh, or Theano, uh, PyTorch, they only they only support first order differentiation because all you need to do is just gradient descent, and that is why. Uh, so yeah, you either you you do like batch gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, but all you need is just first order differentiation, first order derivation of your of your function. Uh, so that is why, but Jax. With Jax, you can easily do like higher order differentiation. So it's good for calculating Hessian. Hessian is like the second order there differentiated. Your your function being function going through uh, second order differentiation. So it's catching on these days, and it's it has all the low level uh, functionalities already like pretty much implemented. It's just that the higher order functionalities like like the ConvNet or RNN or Transformer. I'm not sure if they, these are already implemented in Jax. Like in TensorFlow and PyTorch, there's a like vast amount of like pre-existing library that you can just download and use, like Transformer, BERT, uh, RNN, whatever, all these, like ResNet, they're already there. So you don't need to implement them on your by yourself. But Jax, not so much because it's pretty new. But I think maybe Jax has a better, brighter future than TensorFlow 2.0. All right. Also, okay, so. So today we're gonna I'm trying to implement an RNN, but there will there's a a specific task that we want to do, which is not really related to uh, healthcare, but it's more related to NLP. But it'll be just one like this time once because I'm I'm borrowing this tutorial from the official PyTorch uh, website, so that is why I'm just sticking to their uh, to their tutorial task, so which is classifying names with a character level RNN, so you can. Click the link. If I mean, if you if you want to go over it again, then you can. Right. So here. Yeah. Okay. So given a name, predict its root. Basically, like is my name German or is my name French or Scottish? So, for example, Hinton uh, from Jeff, uh, from the famous researcher Jeffrey Hinton. So Hinton is like. As this is just example. It's not really. This is not really the ground truth. I just made it made it up. But it's like it could be like Scottish fifty two percent, English twenty four percent, Irish fourteen percent, something like that. So there will be eighteen classes. There is also ja Japanese and Korean. So that'll be interesting. So and it's a character level RNN. So you have a name and then you put those names one letter at one letter each to your RNN. And so it, the characters will be like. All the small case letter and the, uh, the large, the uppercase letters. Uh, these are pretty probably not included. Like exclamation mark, question mark, probably not included. Maybe hyphens are included. Uh, yeah, we'll see. So you can. So this is just uh, conceptually. This is what we want to implement. So there's an RNN which has a hidden layer per time step. So and then when you want to classify or predict the root of Hinton, H-I-N-T-O-N, then you put H-I-N-T-O-N and given the last uh, last hidden layer, which is the representation vector of this entire name, you take that you take the representation and put it through a softmax, not not sigmoid, but it's because we're not doing we're no longer doing a binary classification, we're doing multi-class classification where the classes are where there are 18 classes. 
like Scottish, English, Irish, whatever. So you take the representation vector and then put it through a softmax, and that's how you get your prediction, the y hat. Or her prediction will, I mean, so in a vectorized form, your like h, the capital uppercase h, like lowercase i, lowercase n, they will all be a one hot vector. So there will be like, so there's, uh, how many letters are, are there in English? There are 26 letters, like A, B, C, all the way to Z, like X, Y, Z. There's 26 characters and there are two sets, one uppercase, one lowercase. So there will be at least uh, 52 letters, right? I think the, in, in the, uh, in, in actual practice, in the code, I think we're using 57 characters, so probably like dots, uh, dots, hyphens. Yeah, something like, like five more characters are added in, in, in addition to the, the lower char lowercase characters and uppercase characters. But anyway, so it'll be 50, 57 dimensional vector. Your input will be 57 dimensional vector, and only one of them will be one. And the, all the others will be zero. So again, it's a very sparse vector. So it, this is like H I N T O N, and the ones will be in different places, of course. And then the uh, final output will be the Y hat. Your prediction is also an 18-dimensional vector. So and like each each dimension will represent something. This could be like English, Irish, uh, Scottish, Korean, all like something Japanese and Chinese and stuff. And so if you set your h to be a like i don't know 20 dimensional vector then your w will be 18 by 20 dimensional matrix because you want to you want to multiply your h t h like the representation vector to your matrix to get the 18 dimensional vector so it'll be 18 by 20. all right so before we jump into the actual uh the demonstration some some uh, tips in installing your installing PyTorch and Jupyter Labs so or Jupyter Notebook. So uh, this is something I found out like a couple days ago. Before uh, this is so if you are if you typically what you want what you do when you in install PyTorch or NumPy all those like typical like data science packages like uh, NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, including Scikit-Learn. So you manually just install it in your Ubuntu system or in your MacBook or in your Mac OS or Windows, but this is way easier. So when you click this, this is, uh, this pro so what this is, it provides a script to install a Docker image installed with Jupyter. So, um, so what, if anybody's not familiar with Docker, what Docker is, is Docker is like a virtualization helper. I'm not sure how, if I, Describing that correctly. So before, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open both links. All right. So, run. Ju basically, the objective of this script is to run Jupyter Lab in a Docker container, and Jupyter Lab is something. Um, uh, actually, I'll show you. I'll show you guys what Jupyter Lab is like in a, in a minute or two. Basically, what you want to do is what uh, just enter your wait. Why am I? Why is this? All right, so test projects, any, any name that you want it to be. And then we're going to use a password. Uh, so your password could, could be like test. Now you have to choose packages. In, in, so instead of, instead of actually you installing these NumPy, SciPy, Panda, Scikit, like TensorFlow, all these, all these packages on your physical computer drive, this will virtual, this will create a virtual like image or, or virtual environment where you where you install those on that virtual image so that you like you don't you don't like make your computer to like you know you don't want to corrupt your computer or you don't want to like 
load your computer with a lot of packages or like install, uninstall and do all, all those kind of things. If you don't want to do this, like you, you want to use Docker image. And what this is, what this does is it creates a pre made Docker image for you. And you can choose either like, I want this or I want this, or I don't want like, oh, okay. So basically in order to do this, you get me. Okay. So some people might not be interested in installing TensorFlow. So for those type of people, you can, choose only this, like I only want to see NumPy and SciPy and I'll, but in our case, we need to implement PyTorch. So you, you click both of them and then you click this. So you, you, you don't want to like, you don't want to share. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you choose both or not, but for, for our experiments and for, for today's purposes, we don't need solutions. We just need to be able to use Jupyter lab and just implement your code and see, see it, see how it runs and the hosting. So you want to, Jupyter Lab is like a web-based interactive development, uh, development like solution, development platform, something like that. So it's a web-based uh, platform. So you need to have, you need to use your own computer as a server for the web for that web-based platform. So and you're going to use your own servers. You're just going to click local and then you uh, click your uh, you put your email message email address here and then once you Click this. It'll give you a. It'll download a. It'll give you a link or maybe a download, like a package to install you a pre-made Docker image script for you. So let me show you how, how it goes. So I've downloaded my stuff in a drive in a path like this. So our class is ML4H Spring 2020, and I've already. Click the like so. My configuration was like data science, machine learning, both click experiment only, local, and um, all you need to do is just run shell. That's it. Like you go to the path where you downloaded this package, and then you unzip it. I'm not sure if it was zip or not unzip, but anyway, like you need to go go to the path where you download that, and then just run a shell command. Sh run shell. And in my case, I've already downloaded the entire thing. So that's why it's running so fast. But when you're running this for the first time, it'll start downloading a lot of stuff like the NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, TensorFlow, Keras, and all that. It'll just download it on the fly and then install it on your virtual image, the Docker image. And then it'll start like loading up the Docker image. In my case, so my, my, my yeah. In my case, already is finished. But in, if you're running it for the first time, then uh, it's gonna take I know, like a minute or two, maybe five minutes. But if this is way easier than you manually installing, like all those different things, or you, or you can just install like something called Conda or Anaconda. What this? That's another easier way to install all these things on the one go. But that's up to you. Anyway, so I've run my Thing. Oh, so before that, so in order to actually use this, I'm just going to quit, quit. I'm going to quit this. Okay. In order to actually run, run this. So if you look at your run script, it has, it is basically running a Docker command. And in order to use a Docker command, you need to install your install Docker. So Docker, you, you can install it from here. Just like uh, in Mac OS, uh, I use Docker desktop. So that is why you can see the Docker here. It is like running. So if you're using Ubuntu, there's probably like a way, another way to install Docker. For Windows, there's another way to install Docker. So anyway, I need to, you just need to install the Docker and that's it. And then the rest will be taken care of with this very simple script. So again, I'm gonna run this again. And then, so. All you need to do is just localhost 8888. And previously the test, the password I just set for demonstration was test, but I using different password. I'm using AI810. So, and then, all right. So this is basically what you will see. So this is JupyterLab uh, development environment. And um, just as a very, very simple uh, introduction, so you click a notebook Python 3. So you want to use Python 3 and you want to develop your stuff in the notebook environment. So you click this and then, so this is 
just a, like interactive thing. You you can write one line and then run it, and then you can write another line and run it. Something like that. It's like way easier than just uh, writing your code in a in a terminal like Vim or text any text editor and then running it and then debugging it, running it, debugging it. It's, that is that is very very like tedious. That is a tedious job, like a very manual intensive labor job. But here you can just write one line and then execute and that's it so you, you you can just like write one line and see how how it went and write another line and see how it went write another line and see how it went and then if you've developed the entire thing that you want to develop then you can just copy paste that and then actually copy paste that entire code section to the te to to a text file and then start compiling it or, or whatever or, or actually so this is a development tool but once you've finished developing you can export this to a file like a, like a python file a python file like dot pi and then you can start uh training your model or debug your model or whatever all right so so this was just a simple this is probably the easiest way to install everything because you don't have to install it. Like it, it is already, in, everything is already installed for you and you just need to load the Docker image and that's it. All right, so there are certain, uh, there. so I wrote some codes uh, yesterday and a couple of days ago to show you a basic demo. So we're, we'll start with an autograd demo. So, oh, okay. So the good thing is everything is already like low, is installed like NumPy, SciPy, as I said, Tor PyTorch is already implemented. So all you need, all you need to do to use PyTorch is just call this function, import torch, and that's it. So way easier. All right. So you, when you import torch, what I'm going to try to do in this script, in this py, this notebook. So there are four notebooks: one, two, three, four. So in this notebook, what I'm going to try to do is just go through a very simple demonstration of doing, uh, showing you the uh, function of autograd. All right, so you import torch, and then he, this is just a simple two by two matrix filled with ones. Like the X is a, uh, X will look like this basically. So uh, the common thing with TensorFlow, PyTorch, Theano, all these like autograd deep learning libraries, libraries is you want to convert everything into a tensor. So like one dimensional tensor is a vector, two dimensional tensor is a matrix, three dimensional, I mean, it's, yeah. tensor is like the generalization of multi-dimensional vector basically. And everything is converted to tensor in these Theano TensorFlow, all these libraries. Uh, and that's because you want to train your model in, your, in a GPU and GPU is, GPU is a graphical processing unit. And, the reason people started to use GPU is to play computer games or things like that. And everything in a, everything in graph, I mean, everything in graphics processing is just matrix multiple multiplication, matrix operation, basically linear, like a lot of big, big linear algebras. And you want to do it in a, like a large parallel fashion. That's what GPU does for you. Like GPU is like thousands and thousands of cores that can process like millions and millions of like uh, matrices. So that is why you want to convert everything into a tensor so that these are very like fast, these are like uh, quick, rapidly run in GPU environment. So uh, yeah, so Torch uses something called tensor. Uh, TensorFlow, obviously tensor, tensor is like flowing, so it's using tensor. All right, so anyway, so I'm using something called ones to define a tensor filled already with ones. And it's just two by two matrix. So X is a tensor of, uh, X is a matrix. And now you're adding two to your one, uh, two by two matrix. So Y will look like this, like, of course. If you, if you just do, a, um, if this is a two by two matrix, but this is a scalar, but it'll just adapt to the, adapt to the dimensionality automatically, which is called broadcasting. So you can just add two and then it'll just element wise add two. To each dimension, each each element, and then Z is Y squared times three, so it'll look like this. So three times three times three is so twenty-seven, and then the out is basically um, oh I didn't print it out. Uh, this is just average value. So Z is two-dimensional vector, two-dimensional matrix filled with twenty-seven all the, all the way, 
and the average value will be of course 27 so print out and you will get 27 all right so um let's maybe we'll we can remove these two first uh there is a question i guess so doesn't the y times y results in matrix multiplication um uh, okay, I see. That's a that's a good question. So matrix multiplication probably has another command. In so a lot of these oper a lot of these like uh, commands are uh, are borrowing are borrowed from NumPy operation. So NumPy has something called dot so NumPy dot. So dot is a uh, what we know as a matrix multiplication like um okay so this could be a good time to um, use my ipad all right so what right so right before y y was three by three and let's just forget about let's forget about the uh okay three 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 and basically there's two ways to multiply three by three by three which is like the classic way of doing this this and this and this that would be this this is called in numpy this is called np dot but what we did just before just before now with the uh the asterisks operator is just an element wise multiplication so it is like nine 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 and if it was like one one uh so sorry so if it was three, 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 uh, one, two, three, four, it will be three, six, nine, twelve. But if we do dot operator, if we use dot operator here, then it'll be like three times what? Three times nine. So like twelve here. Uh, six times twelve is eighteen here. You, you can see. You can basically see what I mean. Like three times. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's just, you can also use at as syntactic sugar for metmols or batch metmol EGYY. Oh, I didn't know that. Is that, is that, uh, as, uh, emperor, uh, what, are we, what is that called? The at thing. Is that uh, Python specific or does it also apply to TensorFlow? Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So there are obviously a convenient way to do matrix multiplication. Okay, so you can either use. Um, let's see if let's see what the uh, PyTorch has. PyTorch. So let's go to the API doc. Uh, is there something called dot? Okay, there is something called dot. Yeah, okay, it's the same thing. It's the dot product. Just like the NP dot, there's torch dot, and you put like one one tensor and one tensor here, one tensor and another tensor there, and then you can do well. Yeah, you can do matrix multiplication, or you can do you can use the uh, the add thing, kulbengi, just like Michael just uh, recommended. All right. So what screen are we sharing right now? All right. So again, so this will be twelve. Um, 12, 18, if, if we use that, right. Okay, switching back to my screen, I mean, the desktop. All right, so, okay, we're back. So, now what, backward, so out is the, the, the most, uh, Oh, actually, I should have drawn a direct the secret graph. So, um, hmm, sorry, sorry. Let's try to do that again. Oh, uh, no. Thanks.
Now, every single time I call on whiteboard, the previous things are just all erased. That's unfortunate. So what I'm trying to do here is, so um, we have X, which is filled with one. Then Y was X plus two. Then Z was Y squared times three. Then out was uh, y uh, mean of z, so it was uh, z dot mean, which is uh, one one over four z one plus z two plus z three plus z four. So here it is three 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 three. Here it is twenty seven twenty seven twenty seven twenty seven. And I'm just referring to these like one, two, three, four, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. And um, if you if you represent this in a, a direct L cyclic, ah, I'm sorry, wait, am I, is everybody seeing the whiteboard? Oh, okay, so everybody was seeing whiteboard. All right, so there will be uh, the mean operator will, so out is the, the top most, the, the last thing that we derive from this entire, like network or this entire series of series of uh, mathematical operations. So out will be here, but it, it'll come from the mean operation. So there will be a node called mean. And then before that, there will be uh, multiplication, mult, which is mult by three. And then there's, before that there's uh, squared. So this is mult again mult by itself, which was, let's call this y, basically. And then before that, there's, uh, so we, we've covered three times y squared, so there will be add by two, and then before that, there will be just x. So out is the last thing, and x is the first thing, and it goes through a series of like mathematical operations. And each time you, it goes through operation, it each, each, as I, if anybody re remembers what I said the last time, or maybe it was the last time before last time, each mathematical operation has a, has a gradient, like a first order derivation defined within, within the node. So the, this add has like, doesn't, add doesn't change anything to your, your gradient because it's just, you're adding scalar value. Multiplication, now that, it, that depends on like what you multiply, but it it has all the derivation like uh, all uh, like recorded. Like each node had has a gradient information recorded here, 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 and then you when you call backward. So with what you've just seen, out has a something called when you call out backward. That's when you start. With, that's when you call a autograd package to do back propagation all the way back to the start. So out has some value, which would, which was like 27. And you go backwards here and see what the derivative, what, what the gradient, how, how you calculate the first order different, how you, okay, sorry, how you do first order differentiation when there is mean operation. So mean operation, the mean class will already have that defined. So it'll just go through that step and then get the, get the first order derivation. And then it'll go back again to the mult and see what the deriv first order derivation is. And then just do that and do, get, do that and do that. And all the way back, you're going all the way back from, from out to X. And that's how you get the gradient values X. So what you, when you call out at backwards, what you get here is just basically like out X. And of course uh, you can, uh, you can make it so that you will store the print, like uh, intermediate values, like out y and somewhere here out z, like this. So, okay, going now, moving back to the the notebook. Right, so that's what happens when I call it out backward. And then I'll, when I call it and then print out 
uh, this value, it'll be 4.5. So, uh, um, let's just, okay, before I show you why this is 4.5, uh, let's just, let me go through just technical details. So when you call Y grad or Z grad, so Y grad, so this X grad is the, uh, the thing like the derivative, the differentiation of out with, with respect to X and Y grad is y, uh, the differentiation of out with respect to Y, but it says none. And that's because ten, PyTorch just, uh, when you call backward, it'll, it'll just store the, uh, the gradient information in the lowest, no, lowest like node possible, which was X, because we start from X and go all the way to Y, go all the way to out. And Y and Zs are just intermediate values. So the, uh, the, 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 the gradients with respect to Y and Z are not stored. They're thrown away once they're done calculating. And you only just store the, the, la the, like the lowest possible value, the gradient value. But if you put these in, like you want to retain, like you want to, you don't want to throw them away, you want to retain them. So you call this again, we start from top. And then now you have like Y grad and Z grad, right? So why, why the values are 4.5 is, uh, okay, back to the whiteboard. Uh, it's very unfortunate that they're all always, okay, so X was one, 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 one. Y is X plus two, Z was three times Y squared. Out was uh, four, one over four, Z one plus Z two plus Z three plus Z four. And so uh, out with respect to, uh, let's just take one Z, like Z one. So this will, what, what this would be is just, like these are like all like unnecessary. So they are thrown out and all you are left with four, one, one, one over four, which is like a quarter. That's why you had, ah, it's really hard to, okay. So if you remember Z, that Z dot grad was 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25 and 0 0.25. And if you remember Y dot grad was 4.5, uh, 4.5, 4.5, 4.5. And X, X grad was again, 4.5, 4.5, 4.5. So that is why all, all the Z's have 0 0.25, the quarter, because like uh, differentiation of out with, with respect to Z1 or Z2 or Z3, Z4, they will, it'll be just like one over four. And with out with respect to Y, there will be four Y's, but we'll just take one Y. Y1 would be, so this is, out of Z and uh, well, let's just take Z one because we don't do anything. Like we, we're not mixing the dimensions, like different coordinates. So we can just do a coordinate by coordinate. So Z one and Z one differentiation of Z one with respect to Y one is, is basically 1.1 over four times uh, two times. So this is six Y, six Y hat, right? A six y one. You just you take this two and multiply it to three, and then you like you get it to a lower lower order. So it's six y one and y one was so y one. Um, this is three 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 three. This was twenty seven twenty seven twenty seven twenty seven. And uh, six y one. So that is why you this is one over four times eighteen. And so 18 divided by four is 4.5. So that is why you have 4.5 here. Okay, so lastly, lastly, one out, differentiation of out with respect to X1 is out Z1, Z1, Y1, Y1, X1, and four one six Y1. Um, so Y1 re with respect to X1, like here, it's just one because you're just, you just have like X and you differentiate it with, and that's just one here, a constant, it becomes a constant, so like this. So that's why it's again 4.5.
All right, so I hope this is pretty clear to everybody. So we've just done the autograd by hand, which is very stupid. So we don't want to, we, we never want to do this on, on, in practice, but I just wanted to do this just once and be done with it. Like, it's just a, how, just to backtrack what, uh, what PyTorch was doing internally to derive X grad, which was 4.5, 4.5, 4.5, 4.5, 5. All right. Okay, so that's autograd. Now, any questions so far? No. All right, so moving on to module demo. I'm sorry, I'm having breakfast right now, so it might sound a bit weird. So in practice, when you implement your deep learning model in PyTorch, you want to use something called module. And a module is like a, basically, it's a module of neural network, like a small, it could be an entire neural network or it could be like a small portion of neural network and then and you can combine different modules to get a, like a bigger neural network but it basically it's like a some 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 neural network and here what i've done is i'm just going to implement a feed for network with one hidden layer and that's it and now we're going to call something i mean we're, obviously we need torch and we're going to use torch nn which is which has the module class inside and then something called functional which has a uh, ReLU function here so all right um uh, okay just for the sake of completeness i'm gonna just uh briefly go over what ReLU is so okay it's really hard to like switch between different things all the time i'm just gonna write something here So ReLU, so uh, ReLU is another activation function. So sigmoid look like this. Sigmoid look like this, like this is one. And 10, 10H looked like, like this, like one here, uh, negative one here. ReLU this looks like this. So it, it is all zero until, until like in the positive region. So uh, if you use sigmoid function as your activation function, then your neuron will only have output between one and zero. If you use 10H, so this is, this is sigmoid. This is 10H. Okay, this is very bad writing. Okay. And this is something called rectified. Uh, all right, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna write that. It's something called rectified linear units. That is why it's R-E-L-U, ReLU. So let's just write ReLU here, rectified linear units. Anyway, so if you use ReLU, then the output of your neuron will be pot, like non-negative value only. It'll never like all the all the val negative values will be like forced to be zero, and the all the positive values will be just it's the same thing. It's just identity function. So you you wanna. You want to force your neural network to only have positive outputs and positive outputs, positive outputs. So this, uh, like back in back in the days, like before 2014, 2015, people typically use either sigmoid or 10H only when they were learning like their neural networks, and that they didn't really allow like a big like a lot of hidden layers to be used because of the the, the vanishing gradient and exploding gradient thing. So sigmoid and 10H were not were not very like uh, they didn't yeah they they caused the the vanishing or the exploding gradient problem for you when you started using like five layers six layers seven layers but when you use ReLU that is relatively easier you're it's relatively easier to use more layers like ReLU you can use like easily you can easily use like five six seven eight layers and if you combine that with like batch norm and like resi residual connections, you can easily reach like 100 layers and 200 layers and all that. All right.
Okay, so so this is uh, so this is a class called module, and we're going to use we're going to like inherit that and call some implement some some class called feed forward neural net, feed forward net, and this is a class, so you need an init function, and uh, all you need to do to use the module is to have an initiation function, the init function, and a forward function. And that's it. All you need to do is define these two, and the rest will be taken care of by PyTorch. So in the init, what you're doing is you're, you're defining two linear layers. And because we want to have a feed, so um, what I'm assuming here is that the, my input will be 20 dimensional and my output will be five dimensional. So, you know, to draw something here, it'll be 20, 10, and five. So what I'm trying to implement here is just a simple feed for neural network. So it'll be five dimensional, it'll be 20 dimensional, this will be 10 dimensional. And the reason that I'm using five dimensional output is just I'm assuming that something is, has like five classes where we just want to classify some input which has 20 dimension into five classes. So it could be like the marriage status, like single, divorced, widowed, other like something, like it could be like five dimensional thing. And uh, using 10 dimension, it's just a designer's choice. I'm just using 10 dimension as a hidden layer. So in order to implement this, uh, this is what this is what is happening. What's happening here? So the first linear layer. So there should be a matrix. If everybody re remembers the previous uh, lecture, so there should be a matrix of weight of 10 by 20, or it should be 20 by 10 because we're multiplying 20 to, to 20 to make it into 10. So it'll be 20 by 10 matrix, and then the output layer, the the uh, the weight matrix between the output layer and the hidden layer will be a five by ten matrix. So that is why it's 10, 20 by ten, ten by five, and uh, this is just something called linear operate linear operation. Uh, because what's happening, really happening, here is if we call this x, if we call this h, if we call this y, what's happening here is simply h equals w x plus a bias term b and some sigmoid function i mean some 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 nonlinear function like could be sigmoid could be 10 h could be value so some some nonlinear function and this is a linear operation you're just multiplying a matrix to a vector so this is a linear operation that is why it's called linear and the linear function holds a bias term in, like it automatically has a bias term inside. So you don't need to like define a bias term here. Uh, like you don't need to define a, like a separate bias term. The linear function, the linear like thing, this, this API has the W and B inside internally. So you just need to define the dimensionality like 20 by 10, 10 by five, and that's it. And what you actually, so this is just defining your weights and the forward function is what is where the actual like flow workflow happens. So you want to start from X, you want to push it to the H and then push it to the Y. So this is a forward operation. And there was like a backward thing. Like previously I showed you guys out that backward. So that's backward operation, but we need to, in order to use backward operation, we need to define a forward operation. So this is what happened here. So in the forward thing would be you just, put your X input, so there's an input. So you just put your X input into your linear layer. So FC1, X, and you want to use a nonlinear function, which where, where that, so ReLU is where, well, that's when you use ReLU. So you just use ReLU in front of your linear layer, and that's how you complete your H. And then you take your H, well, this could be, this could have been H like this, and this could have been H. And this could have been Y and Y, basically. So you take your H and then put it through another linear layer, uh, which is this one. And then you get a Y out of this, but this is not exactly a Y. So you, what you have here is just a, some number, like some five dimensional number, but in order to make that into a probability of like classification, you need to put it through a softmax. So that's, there's, that's where softmax comes in. So your, your softmax will look like this. So. I'm gonna clear everything up. So just assume that this is Y and this is Y. And 
So you're putting it through a softmax function. And the, the reason that there is dim one is, so PyTorch assumes that everything is operated in, in a batch fashion, like a mini batch. So you're not, when you have a, when you have a network of 20 by like 20, 10, five, you're not just, op, you're, you're not just processing one 20 dimensional sample at a time. You're actually handling like multiple samples at a time. So it could be like five by 20. Like if you're handling five samples at a time, so a mini batch of five, then your input will no longer look like just a simple vector, but it'll, it'll be uh, like this, like it'll be a five by 20. So, so each, each row is like a sample. So this will be your mini batch. And you, because you put it through the hidden layer and the, and the final layer, then after that, your this is x, so this is it. Eh, what happened? This is your x, and this. Uh, let's just use six just for the sake of uh, like clarity. So let's just use. So this is a mini batch of six samples, and when you put it through the hidden layer, it'll be six by ten. And then when you put it through the final output layer, it'll be a six by five. So this will be your Y. And you have, so there is, should be like a five dimensional probability for each sample. So there, like you want, you want the, uh, the e individual, you want, when you sum these like one, two, three, four, five dimensions, you want that to be like a 1.0, like a convex sum, because it's a probability. And again, for the second, for the second, um, sample, you also want that to be summed up to 1.0, but like the, the distributions will be different. Like it'll be like 0 0.123 something, but it'll be like 0 0.432 or something. Like just for example, it'll be like different, different probabilities. So in order to, but so why, so before you put it through softmax, it'll be some number, some like one, like some, some number that you don't understand. And then, or it'll be more like an energy and when you put it through, when you do put it through a softmax here, that will be actual a probability. So this is like, let's just call this y tilde. Like, and so you want to want to put the y tilde through a softmax function to get the proper probability. And because you're using a six size mini batch, you want to have your softmax operated on on this this dimension not not this dimension because you want you want this dimension to sum up to 1.0 not not this dimension this is the mini batch dimension this is the this is actually this is the uh, class dimension that is why you use dim dim one if you set it to dim zero then it, it won't make any sense because dim zero is this way and dim one is this way so you that's why you put it you set it to dim one all right so Hope well, the uh, technical details are all very clear now. Okay, so already ten six. I'm not sure if we can if we can go through all the examples today. All right, so we've defined a class here. So you want to instantiate the class, and I'm just going to call that FFN. And uh, all right, you have to execute this. Execute this now. When you act, when you instantiate your module and print it out then it'll uh, show you the the the, uh, the member layers or the basically the properties will you, you set your la linear layers as as a prop like a class property so that is why it's showing the class property fc1 is like a 20 by 10 linear layer and fc2 is a 10 by 5 linear layer something like that and you can see that the bias is true so i said that linear layer already contains w and b the matrix and the bias so, and we didn't, we don't need to do anything about the bias. So that, and you can see that it's already set to true. But if you set, when you, when you set this to like bias false, then it'll be false. Then this, this linear layer will no longer have the B. It'll be just W times X. So which, which is not what we want right now. So I'm just gonna do this. All right. And the good thing about module is that when you instantiate it, so the instantiation FFN, it will contain, it will have a member function named parameters. And when you 
and it's just a list of parameters. You have two, you should have four parameters here. So you should have four parameters because each linear layer has a matrix and a vector, matrix and a bias. Then we have another linear layer, which also has a matrix and a, and a vector, W and B. So when you print out this function, this, this, uh, this segment here, you should see four parameters, which is basically here. So this is your first weight matrix between the input layer and hidden layer, which is 20 by 10. Then there's 10 dimensional bias vector. Then there's 10, uh, 10 by five and five dimensional vector. So WB, WB, right. Yeah, what's happened here? Okay. Right, so this, I'm just gonna skip this. Now, <clears throat> we're gonna try to push some inf information, push some example into the FFN, the instantiation. So X is just random 10 by, so I'm gonna use, uh, just to stick with our example, uh, the, the, the graphical example, I'm gonna use a mini batch of size six. And so it's a six by 20. So there's six samples in our mini batch and it'll each sample will have 20 dimensional, it will have 20, dim 20 dimensions filled with just random number. Uh, and you put your input uh, six samples into your neural network, feed for a neural network and you get a Y hat, which is just your probability. So it'll look like this. So it's a six by five matrix where each dimension corresponds to a certain class. And you want that to sum up to one. So if you sum this row, it'll sum up to one. If you sum this one, it'll be one again, again, again. All right. And let's see. So these are our predictions. The Y hats are our prediction. But let's just, for, for the sake of argument, let's say the true class for these six samples was look like this, like for six samples, the first dimension was the true class and all the other, and like, so just for the sake of our sake of argument. So let's just say, like these are very wrong predictions, obviously, because you can see that all these six samples have the fourth class as the true class, predicting the fourth class as a true class, but the reality, the ground truth is that the first class was the, the true class. So we're gonna do, uh, negative log likelihood basically. So the loss function, or let's call this NLL. No, negative, negative log likelihood. There should be negative here. So, neg so in binary class, in a binary classification, in binary classification, uh, maybe it's a good idea to switch back to the whiteboard. All right, so in binary classification, your cross and your negative log likelihood function looked like this. So your NL, your loss function of y comma y hat was, uh, why are there dots here? It's true y times log of y hat plus, oh, it should be negative log like, so there's like neg negative right here. And one minus true times log of, one minus y hat and oh and you should okay i'm sorry so this is just for a single example and uh, it, it actually should look like this like one one over number of samples and negative here uh sigma i to the n and y i log of y hat i plus one minus y i log of one minus y hat i. Uh, so, okay, so big, big bracket here. So this was uh, NLL for binary, class, binary classification. All right, so basically what, you're, what we're trying to do here is that we want to uh, divide the divide the case when the true class is one or zero. So if the true class is one, we take this. If the trust true class true class is zero, then we take we take this, right? But in multi class classification uh, scenario like this, like in our five dimension five class 
example, we no longer need to stick to this. We no longer need to like divide our uh, divide our our cases like this, like explicitly, like in a binary case. All you need to do is, for example, uh, in a in a vector form. So this is these are all scalars, like y i y hat y. Like these are all scalar values. But now we are sticking to like vector uh, vector formats. So your y, your true y, will look like will be something like one uh, one comma zero comma zero comma zero comma zero. So this this indicates that the first class was a true class, and your y hat would look like uh, like zero point two, zero point three, zero point one, zero point one. So five seven, uh, so what is five six seven eight zero point two something like this. So your both your y your true class y, true y and your prediction y is five dimensional vector. So all you need to do is just simply l y comma y hat is now uh, negative. So let's just do it for one one sample like 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 this. We're just this will be mapped to. In a multi-class classification setting, simply negative y log y, but this will be a vector now. Now, what what really happens is 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 exactly like this, the same thing in binary classification. So when you multiply y, your true y, with your predicted prediction y log of your prediction, basically what see what happens is everything dies out. Everything dies out because these are all zeros, and only your true class survives. And if so, this will be a negative uh, log of like zero point two, basically. And you can uh, you can obviously generalize it to multi class multi. I mean, like mini batch setting, like negative negative n over one sigma n. Um, y vector i log y hat vector i. So you don't. So you can see why we're no longer. We don't. No, we no longer need to divide the case between like when the y is zero and y is one because this was necessary because the y was this y, y was this was necessary because y was scalar. But the, we no longer need. We no longer need to like explicitly divide the cases because now y's y and y hats are multidimensional and if you just multiply them then only the true class will survive so if, if this was one then only this will survive if this is one like this will survive basically so negative log likelihood is way simpler in like mathematically it's just simpler than, than this in multi-dimensional setting all right so going back to going back to the jupiter lab So that's why what's happening here. Negative log likelihood. Negative here. Y true times your log of y hat. Uh, there's a question. How about one minus y part? So one minus y part was necessary because we, because y was scalar. So when the true y is one, then we want to have the, uh, we want to maximize its maximize the predicted value, the log of y. When true class of true class of when the true class was zero, meaning that the y is zero, then we want to minimize the predicted log y hat. That is why we divide it into both parts. But now, uh, yeah, now we don't need we no longer need to do to do that it's because, like as I as I've shown you, if you just multiply the y vector with the log of y hat vector, then only the true part will survive. And we want we only want to maximize that part. Um, uh, does it make, is it clear? Um, OK, cool. So that's called, so negative log likelihood for the multi-dimensional setting is sometimes called like multi-dimensional cross entropy so it's just a generalization of binary cross entropy function all right so going back to our example so you just multiply the true y to your log of y the prediction y and then you set the negative because we're doing negative log likelihood and we have six samples we're using mini batch of size six so we want to average them out 
the the one over n times plus the so this is the one over n sigma part the mean mean part and so when we, when you print the loss ah oh, sorry nll let me print the negative log, log, log likelihood this is something like 0 0.3459 and we want to minimize it so that it goes to zero, but we won't do that now. We won't use gradient descent. We will use gradient descent in the next sample, ne next example. So the loss backward. So uh, this should also be NLM. So your your entire network, the feed forward neural network, is derived uh, arrives at this particular value NLL. So your x x the your x input, which was six by twenty uh, matrix. So it's a mini batch of six six samples and you put that through your network and then you derive your loss function and i mean you derive your loss value which is nll and nll is now a scalar value and you, when you call the backward function from your like the the most like the the topmost node or topmost the, the final final value that you derive from your network and you call it your backward then then you can easily see that it'll go back through all the way down to the x and um Oh no, sorry. It'll go down to the parameters because what we want to do is learn the parameters. So X is something that we just defined. And what we want to do is actually learn the learn the gradients of the parameters though. So the WB here, WB here, we want to learn the gradients of them so that we can update them by like doing like a uh, gradient update. So, so as I said, uh, the function, the, the class instantiation has a, has a, like a member function called parameters. And you can, when you when you go through each like WMB and WMB and try to print their gradient value. Oh, why is it? Oh, we didn't call this actually. So we call this and then we get this. So when you call backward and then you print their gradient value, it'll look like this. So the f the first gradient will of course be like twenty by ten dimensional matrix. Then your gradient for the bias vector, the first bias will be a ten dimensional like vector and this is 10 by 5 this is 5 so you get the gradients and then you take these gradients and then you multiply it by some some learning rate and then add it to your previous weight value and that's how you get the new weight value all right so so far so good i hope i hope that by showing you guys this, I hope that everybody feels confident they can, they can, well, not confident, but at least they're comfortable trying out their own neural network, at least like a, a simple neural network like this. Like you can easily add more layers. Like you can add like FC3, FC4, FC5 to make it five, five uh, neural network with five hidden layers and then do like, you can do like binary classification or multi-class classification or you can use like your regression function as well you can like you you get you get the basic idea right so i've covered the autograd and module and or i'm just going to end early today so because the next one is pretty heavily loaded right guys right uh, so there's like a big big uh, boilerplate that so what i what i briefly told you is uh we we want we want to classify a name based on its letters into different like origins like korean japanese and things like that and um, so we need to have a data like we need to have like a like a big sample of names to actually train your neural network to start to classify correctly classify the names into correct origin so the data uh, you can well, i mean if you're interested you can download it from here. You can download data from here and extract it into current directory. So I I've done downloaded it and then extracted into here data names, and there are in total eighteen origins. So Arabic, Chinese, Czech, Dutch, English. So and when you click, like, let's just see what it really holds. Now you can see that this is totally wrong. I don't think there's uh, Cho is not Korean named. I think this is the same as Choi, like Tre and Tre and Tre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo, 
I don't think there's a last name Mo in Korean. Or do we? Yeah, Ri is the same as Lee, I guess. Yeah, anyways, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I don't think we have Sook in Korea. Maybe we do. We have all kinds of names, but it's not very. You, you. Yeah, this is also wrong. Anyway, you can see like each each file, each text file has like bunch of names, like Arabic name. So our, there are way more Arabic names than Korean names, obviously. Uh, Korean names like only ninety four. Japanese name, way more. Um, English name, probably a lot more. Right. So. So we're going to use this. So you can see that Abrams is should be categorized, predicted into like English and like Alst should be classified into Dutch. So we have the names and we know their we know their true label. So we're going to use this information to train your neural network recurrent specifically recurrent neural network a bunch of times and then we hope that it will start to recognize the names correctly. Okay, I'm just going to shut this down. Right. So, uh, yeah. So in order to feed your neural network with, like, names, name samples, you need to first read these names from the, all those text files. So that's why. And, you know, uh, some, some names are, like, using Unicode because, like, there are certain, like, uh, like, like names like this. Like, S has a, like, accent. And A has an accent, and you want to uh, you you want to convert them to ASCII code, like basically just simple lowercase letter, lowercase English letters, and uppercase English letters, and so that's why you have a lot of like different functionalities. So you read, so yeah, this is a big boilerplate. You read like the names from those files, and you convert them to like ASCII code, and that's it. So, and then once you have once you've done that, then you will have a dictionary of names, like dictionary. Where the keys are the country names, and the, each 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 key has a like a vector value, like a list of names, a bunch of lists of names. So that's that's what that. So this is basically the same thing as pre-processing your mimic mimic three EHR. You need to pre-process your your data and load it into like a like a manageable format in order to feed your your own network with samples. So uh, like a big boilerplate code, and then after that there is the part where we define RNN. So starting from the next class, we'll start to, we'll try to go over line by line, like what, so this is not exactly an RNN. This is like a very, very stupid, naive RNN where you don't even have a nonlinear activation. Like you, you can see that there is no value, there's no 10A to a sigmoid. It's just like linear update, linearly updating your hidden cells all over and over again. So we'll mathematically derive that starting from next class. All right. So when, once you've done that, then we'll, you can see like the confusion matrix and that, so, such and such. So once we've done the stupid naive RNN, we'll actually go to the actual RNN where we do mini, but mini batch update. So this doesn't do mini batch update. This just you, this example just feeds one name at a time to the RNN, the, the naive RNN, and then try to back propagate. But as I said, all PyTorch implementation assumes that it is using multiple, like a like a mini batch of like n, not not more like larger than one. So we're gonna change this code into mini batch version of proper RNN and see how it goes. All right, okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, is there any questions so far regarding today? Like it's too easy, too difficult, unnecessary. Like whatever. Like feedback. Any feedback? Do you feel confident that you can use PyTorch now? I hope so. All right, so if there's a question, let's just uh, finish the class now and then. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to go over this example. I, actually, I'll, I'll upload this, this notebook, the iPad. The, so this is the I, IPYNB. This is like the four notebooks that I'm gonna, that three note, two notebooks that I introduced today and the two notebooks that I'm gonna go over next Tuesday. So I'm going to upload these notebooks so that maybe if you're interested, you can install the Jupyter Lab using the Docker image that I introduced and then just copy paste the notebooks that I, that I, that I am going to upload and then see how it goes. So I'll 
do that. If you have time over the weekend, you can go through the notebooks and and see how it goes. So I'll upload them. I'll upload them on Classroom. All right. Thank you guys. Uh, have a good weekend. See you next Tuesday. Bye bye.